Welcome to Skinner and Chalmers Weekly Roast. Today, from university lectern to hot stove, Chalmers taste of several kitchens of professional kitchens of professional kitchens. Good evening, listeners. I'm Seymour Skinner, your principal host. And with me tonight is the ever suave, the man who's cooked in some of the most high-pressure kitchens you can imagine. Chalmers, how are you doing this fine evening? I'm as well as one can be after dodging flying pots and pans. Skinner, it's a pleasure to be here, as always. Ah, those were the days. You know, back when we were mere mortals trying to navigate the treacherous waters of culinary creation. Speaking of which, today, we're diving into a delicious tale from Chalmers' past exploits in several kitchens of professional kitchens. And I've got a spicy story to share that'll have you reaching for your fire extinguisher. Oh, do tell. But beware, Skinner, the spotlight might be too bright for even your illustrious culinary escapade. True, true. But before we set the scene, there is one thing that we want to tell you first. You might noticed it already. At least the old dogs of our podcast will have heard. Yes, we now have much better audio quality in the weekly roast, and we hope you like it and enjoy the podcast even more. Ah, oh, yes. Tezens was kind enough to provide us with new equipment, to put it that way. We hope you like the changes. Feel free to leave feedback in the comments. This podcast is an ongoing project anyway, where things are constantly being improved or changed here and there. So please let us know what you think. Oh yeah, please do. But for now, back to our today's topic. Let's set the scene first. Picture this, a kitchen brimming with potential, a cast of characters eager to impress, and me, Seymour Skinner, attempting to channel my inner Gordon Ramsay. Or so I thought. Ah, oh, the infamous night when you decided to outdo the great chefs with an exotic ingredient. I can still smell the smoke, and not just from the kitchen. Yes, yes, that fateful evening. It all started with a desire to impress, perhaps even a dash of competition between us. You see, Chalmers, I had come across this rare spice, Let's call it dragon breath pepper for dramatic effect. It was supposed to be the beast de resistance of my culinary creation. The night you thought a single pinch could elevate your dish from edible to gastronomic masterpiece. It's all about pushing boundaries, Chalmers. And speaking of boundaries, let's not forget how that spice pushed the limits of our kitchen's ventilation system. Indeed. The exhaust fan became a spectator as it watched the drama unfold from the outside. I remember the moment it gave up and decided to take an early retirement. And that's when the real adventure began. The smoke alarms were screeching, the fire alarm went off, talk about a performance piece, and there we were, a kitchen full of ingredients, no clear exit plan. And let's not forget the unexpected guests. I thought Dr. Eggman had set up a trap with all those sirens and commotion. Right, the surprise visit from Sonic and Shadow. They offered helpful advice while we were trying to salvage the situation. I'll never forget Sonic's attempt at a fireman's carry with those gloves on. It was a sight to behold. But back to the spice that started it all, Skinner. How did you think you'd salvage the dish after the ventilation incident? With the kitchen engulfed in smoke and chaos, I made a bold decision. I turned to our trusted instant pot. Let's call it the pressure cooker of last resort and attempted to transform that fiery mess into a dish worthy of our survival. And let me guess, it was a success. Because the next thing I know, we're sitting down to eat what you dubbed the dragon breath delight. Against all odds. Yes, with some quick thinking and a few tweaks, that dish became an unexpected hit. It was a testament to improvisation, teamwork, and the power of a good fire extinguisher. It's a wonder we didn't end up on one of those oops. We did it wrong cooking shows. But you know, Skinner, that night taught us more than just how to handle a kitchen fire. Indeed, it did. It was a lesson in humility and the importance of not overestimating one's own culinary prowess. Ah. And it also reinforced the value of a good fire safety plan. <sighs> Who knew that my dragon breath pepper adventure would end up being such a memorable experience? It's definitely one for the book, Skinner. And as we reflect on this culinary calamity, let's hope our listeners take away some valuable lessons and perhaps a few laughs. After all, every chef has their dragon breath moment. Absolutely, Chalmers. And to all the aspiring chefs out there, remember, always read the label on that spice jar and never cook when you're feeling particularly competitive. Or is that just us? Perhaps just us, Skinner. 
But who knows, maybe your dragon breath pepper will inspire a new trend in cooking. Well, uh, if it does, I hope the royalties are enough to cover the cost of that fire extinguisher. Agreed. Well, Chalmers, I suppose it's time to peel back the layers of the onion that is your past culinary endeavors. You've always claimed you couldn't cook, but now I'm beginning to wonder if that was ever truly the case. Oh, Skinner, it's a tale of transformation and turmoil. When I transitioned from lecturing at the university to working in several kitchens of professional kitchens, it was quite the culture shock. I thought grading papers was high pressure. I can only imagine the chaos that ensued when you first stepped into a kitchen. Was it like a scene from a madcap comedy? Not quite a comedy, but close enough. My first day was a symphony of sizzling pans, clanging pots, and a cacophony of chefs barking orders. It was like learning a new language, the language of knives, grills, and herbs. Multitasking is an art form in itself. I've seen you juggle school responsibilities with my culinary calamities. How did you manage the transition from academia to the kitchen, Frey? It was a mix of necessity and, admittedly, a bit of an escape from the academic bubble. I had to learn quickly. The kitchen staff became my new colleagues, my comrades. In arms against the culinary clock, we shared more than just recipes. We shared laughter and occasionally the brunt of a hot pan. Sounds like you found your tribe. I can relate. Running a school is much like managing a kitchen. Both require leadership, timing, and an ability to stay calm under fire. Absolutely, Skinner. The parallels are uncanny. In both realms, you're expected to perform miracles with limited resources, and the stakes are high. A student's grade or a poorly executed dish can have significant consequences. Indeed. And let's not forget the jargon. From educational buzzwords to culinary terms, I'm beginning to think I should have been a chef. At least then, edible portions would make sense. You'd be a natural, Skinner. Remember that time you tried to prepare a three-course meal for our dinner party and ended up with, let's call it creative cuisine. Ah, oh, yes. The infamous dinner. I maintain it was an avant-garde culinary experience. But tell me more about this culinary world you found yourself in. What were the greatest challenges you faced? The pace was brutal. Orders flying in. Each ticket a challenge to be met with precision and speed. And the heat. It's not just about bearing the temperature. It's about enduring the pressure. Every night is a performance, and every dish must be perfect. It sounds both exhilarating and exhausting. You handled it with grace, as always. What skills did you acquire that you never anticipated you'd need? I learned to think on my feet to make decisions quickly without compromising quality. I became fluent in the language of flavors and textures, and I discovered a level of camaraderie among kitchen staff that I hadn't known was possible. We were a team fighting the good fight against empty plates and looming deadlines. That's quite the accomplishment. It's like herding cats, but with pans and knives involved. And now let's not forget the culinary lingo you've mastered. Can you tell our listeners about some of the more colorful terms you've come across? Of course, Skinner. Garnish and ring. When a dish looks so good that other chefs are jealous. Saws by the shame. When your perfectly cooked item is overshadowed by someone else's even more perfect item than mise en place regret, which occurs when you realize you prepped everything but forgot the most critical ingredient. I can see how that would be a recipe for disaster, or rather, a recipe for needing to adapt on the fly. It's a whole different world from the one we navigate here in the field. Indeed. But at the end of the day, whether it's educating minds or nourishing bodies, we both strive for excellence in our respective domains. True. And I must say, you've brought a touch of that kitchen discipline to our dinner table. Your culinary adventures have certainly spiced up our lives, my dear friend. Yeah, well, a man's got to know his way around a kitchen, especially when the alternative is your all creative cuisine, Skinner. Fair point. I'll stick to managing the chaos from behind the stove and let you handle the knives, at least for a few days. Our listeners are surely getting a taste of both our worlds. And what a flavorful combination it is. From educating to cooking, we cover the gamut, don't we? We do indeed, my friend. And it's always a pleasure to share our stories with everyone tuned in. Now let's open the floor to our listeners. What culinary or educational challenges have you faced that you've turned into triumphs? That's right, folks. Share your stories with us. 
After all, we're all about turning lemons into lemonade. Or should I say, turning a bad recipe into a feast for the senses. Now, Chalmers, my dear, care to enlighten our audience as to what prompted this gastronomic gamble. Why did you gave up your job at the university for working in a much more stressful job as a chef? Well, Seymour, it was a midlife crisis of sorts. I needed a change from the monotony of lecturing. You know how it is, reciting the same lectures year after year, your voice bouncing off empty lecture halls. And I've always had a passion for cooking. It's like solving puzzles with flavors instead of logic. A passionate chef to be, and I thought you don't like cooking. That explains the culinary odyssey that followed. Speaking of which, let's take our listeners on a journey back to when I attempted to impress you and our guests with a dish so exotic it would make even the most refined palates one. Ah, yes. The infamous night of the Tang Dynasty delight. I remember that quite clearly. Your kitchen looked like a set from a Psy by movie. Indeed it did. I had read about this rare ingredient, a Sichuan lantern pepper said to elevate any dish to the heavens. Little did I know, it would also elevate our kitchen to the stratosphere, literally. Oh, a chaos that ensued. Our extractor fan, normally the unsung hero of my cooking endeavors, decided to take an early retirement. Sparks were flying, alarms were wailing, and Cosmo was hiding under the bed, convinced it was the apocalypse. Now... Now, let's not forget that I managed to extinguish the flames with nothing but a fire extinguisher and my unwavering culinary determination. Though I must admit, it was more the fire extinguisher than my determination. Of course, Seymour. Your culinary determination is legendary. It's what singed the roof tiles after all. But back to the kitchen fiasco. What happened next? I remember the smoke was so thick I could barely see my own hand in front of my face. And that's when the real adventure began. The kitchen was a disaster, but in the midst of the chaos, I had an epiphany. This wasn't a failure. It was a culinary experiment of the highest order, a serendipitous blend of spices and smoke infusing into what could only be described as a smoky Sichuan symphony. The symphony, you say? I believe our smoke detectors would disagree. They were singing an opera of their own, if I recall correctly. True, true. But let's not forget the neighbors. Sonic was convinced he was in a high-speed chase. Shadow thought it was a ritual to summon the ancient gods and Echo. Well, she just pressed her emergency recall button and disappeared before the drama even peaked. Classic Echo. I'm surprised she didn't burst in with the latest news. But back to the symphony, did this culinary experiment actually taste good once you extinguished the fire? I seem to remember a certain look of horror on our guests' faces. Well, it was an acquired taste, I suppose. The dish itself was edible, though the flavor profile was unexpected. A hint of smoke with a dash of panic and a generous spoonful of adrenaline. Not exactly what one expects from a five-star dining experience. And yet our guests left with full bellies and even fuller stories to tell. I believe Master Chief even logged it as a unique combat scenario in his database. Yes, yes, a culinary battle indeed. And though the kitchen was out of commission for a while, it was worth it for the memories and the new fire extinguisher I had to buy. Ah, those memories, Seymour. They're certainly something. And they remind me that sometimes the best recipes are the ones that don't go as planned. Indeed, my dear friend. In the kitchen of life, as in the culinary kind, it's often the unexpected ingredients that make for the most unforgettable dishes. Speaking of unexpected ingredients, how can we forget Sonic and Shadow's helpful intervention? I must admit their arrival was as timely as it was, erm, unusual. Oh, they certainly added a new flavor to the evening. I've never seen old Bartholomew scamper away so quickly. Yes, and to think that they thought they could salvage your prized cabbage soup, including that weird exotic ingredient with, what was it, electric kangaroo essence. I still haven't quite figured out the science behind that. The scientific method certainly took a leap in our kitchen that day. But let's not forget the lessons we learned, my dear Chalmers. First and foremost, always keep the fire extinguisher within arm's reach. Absolutely. And perhaps a clearer communication protocol between roommates. Though I must say, our so sonic on shadow protocol does have a certain ring to it. Indeed, it does. It's almost as if we plan this for our upcoming safety training seminar. How not to turn your kitchen into a fireworks display. That would be an event, wouldn't it? 
though I think our neighbors might have had enough excitement for the both of us with that little fiasco. Mm. True. Sonic and Shadow's helpful advice did ensure that we've gained new respect for kitchen appliances and each other's culinary endeavors. Oh, absolutely. I mean, who knew that toaster had such a temper? And speaking of neighbors, how have Echo and Master Chief been holding up since our last adventure? Well, Echo's been seen with an array of new gadgets, claiming they're for various missions. I suspect she's preparing for her next Overwatch operation. Ah, always on the lookout for her next big challenge. As for Master Chief, he's been seen patrolling the neighborhood more frequently. I think he's taken up a side job as our unofficial neighborhood watch. A Spartan in our midst. It does give one a sense of security, doesn't it? Though I wouldn't want to be on his bad side indeed, Seymour. And speaking of side jobs, how well has Cosmo been coping with the new pet alligator siblings? Cosmo has taken to leading the pack. He's quite the space astronaut, so he sees his gator friends as fellow celestial explorers. Celestial alligators. I can only imagine the cosmic adventures they embark on. Perhaps we should start a podcast series called Gators in Space. Now that's an idea with legs, or should I say gators? And speaking of adventures, how about we recount the tale of our last fire drill? It was quite the spectacle. Oh, it was indeed. We turned the entire neighborhood into a makeshift assembly point. I think every pet within a five-mile radius joined in. From Sonic and Shadow's emergency zoom to Master Chief's tactical formation, we certainly set a new standard for community involvement. Yes, we did. I believe the fire department is still talking about it. They've requested a demonstration for their annual training session. Well, if our kitchen mishap can teach others the importance of safety and clear communication, then perhaps it wasn't such a calamity after all. True, Seymour. And it's given us quite the collection of stories to share on this fine day. Indeed, my friend. It's these moments that remind us of the joy and chaos that come with living together. And, of course, the unparalleled support we offer each other. Even when faced with an electrical kangaroo essence disaster. Couldn't have said it better myself, Seymour. Here's to many more adventures and lessons learned, hand in hand, under this very roof. To adventures, mishaps, and the unbreakable bond of roommates. Cheers, Chalmers. Cheers indeed, my dear friend. And to our listeners, may your homes be safe, your rooms be harmonious, and your fire drills never quite as eventful. Speaking of adventures, remember that time we tried to make Sonic's chili so hot it could power the Death Store? Ah, yes. We nearly turned Sonic into a human poppadom. And there we were, thinking we could match his speed with spice. It was a culinary experiment gone awry. But let me tell you, nothing quite brings people together like the shared pain of consuming the equivalent of a dragon's breath. Indeed, it was an experience. And it taught us a valuable lesson. When in doubt, add cheese. It's the universal solution to any problem. That, and always have a good first aid kit on hand. I'm still recovering from the milk incident with old Barthamolo. Oh, the haunted house party. Your skeleton Pete gave everyone the shock of their lives. Literally. Four would have thought he'd be such a good actor. If only all our pets had such talent. Imagine a world where dinner parties involve not just food, but ghosts as well. Now, that's an idea for the books. Speaking of books, remember when I tried to impress the university board with my ancient recipes? Yes, and how you ended up serving the ancient recipes from the 90s. They thought you were a culinary archaeologist. I maintain it was a lost culinary art. But let's not forget your attempt at hosting a formal dinner for Master Chief and Echo. It was a cultural exchange, Chalmers. And considering their diet mainly consists of cortex monitoring and turret shells, I think I did a commendable job. Commendable indeed, Commander Skinner. Your strategic culinary choices have saved us from many a gastronomic disaster. Thank you, General Chalmers. I shall wear that compliment like a medal of honor. You should. It's as shiny and well-earned as the time you deep-fried Cosmo by mistake. Ah, uh, yes. That was the night we hosted a dinner for Yugi, and I decided to experiment with a new deep-fryer. Let's just say Cosmo had a close encounter with the Philosopher's Stone. It was more like the Philosopher's Bubble. But it's these moments, Seymour, that define our friendship. The laughter, the chaos, and the occasional culinary catastrophe. Indeed, Chalmers. 
and I wouldn't change a thing. These experiences, good or bad, have become the fabric of our lives together. And before our listeners think who knows what bad things, no, Cosmo is fine, he is an orb pet. These orbs can withstand temperatures of up to 2,000 degrees Celsius without any problems and they are also extremely durable in other respects. They are as round as balls. The Deep Fat Fryer is actually a favorite spa unit for Cosmo, as it's only lukewarm for him if I'm not careful in the kitchen for a moment. He secretly jumps in there and gets frying. Speaking of which, I want to express how grateful I am for your companionship, Seymour. You've turned every mishap into a memory worth cherishing. And I can't thank you enough for the unwavering support and understanding you've shown me over the years. Our friendship is truly a culinary masterpiece, my friend. A masterpiece of mishaps and memories, indeed. And as we wrap up this podcast, I want to say thank you to all our listeners for sharing in our adventures. Yes, thanks to everyone who's tuned in, laughed with us, and perhaps even learned a thing or two about the art of culinary adventure and friendship. Indeed, who knows what new stories we'll have to share next time. That's the spirit, Chalmers. And who knows what crazy kitchen escapades we'll embark on in the future. Perhaps a cookbook with our culinary experiments might be in order. A cookbook of what not to do in the kitchen. I'm all for it. It could be an interactive experience where listeners can guess what dish turned out to be a disaster. Yes. A culinary mystery book. Listeners can play detective with our recipes and try to figure out what went right or hilariously wrong. And if our past experiences are any indication, there'll be no shortage of material. I'm looking at you, Skinner, and your infamous vegan meatloaf that became an edible sculpture. It was abstract culinary art, and it taught us the importance of reading recipes all the way through before starting. Indeed, it did. And as we close this chapter, I want to reiterate how much your friendship and your sense of humor about our kitchen escapades has meant to me. And I couldn't agree more, Chalmers. Our friendship is a testament to the fact that even when things go awry, there's always laughter and a lesson to be learned. That's a wrap on our podcast, but not on our adventures. And I speak for both of us when I say we look forward to creating new memories, in the kitchen or otherwise. Here's to new beginnings and the unexpected turns our lives will surely take. And to all our listeners, keep the spirit of adventure alive, one recipe at a time. Thank you for joining us on this culinary journey, filled with laughter, learning, and the occasional gastronomic mayhem. Until next time, keep cooking, keep laughing, and remember, when in doubt, always invite your friends over. They'll love you, or at least your stories, regardless of the outcome. To new beginnings, Chalmers, and to our listeners, may your kitchens be filled with joy, your dishes delightful, and your memories unforgettable. Signing off for now, but not out for good, till we roast next week. Cheers, Seymour. And to all our listeners, stay tuned for what's next. Who knows? Maybe we'll start that cooking show after all. Until then, take care and keep the humor alive. In the kitchen or anywhere else life takes you. Goodbye for now, but not farewell. We'll always have our kitchen stories and each other.